this core committer, but we're watching them scale into the new role of, you know, Linus, not uh, Fox. Uh, and, but, I mean, I, I believe it's going to come up on a release candidate soon, which is exciting. So, hi, I'm Cliff Cromer. Uh, I'm going to talk about a death march through the interface of the storm and uh, I'm, uh, the, well, I have some new title now, but I don't remember what it is. Anyway, I'm the CTO here at InfoChimps. Uh, at least I was until very recently. I'm now the, uh, some new title I don't remember. <laughs> InfoChimps is a CSC company. We were just acquired by CSC, which is uh, um, really amazing. I mean, they'd sell it to the stuff we did, which was, you know, uh, kind of taking a business application and make it really useful for enterprise companies will we, we were just barely good enough at that they sell at it we have the right tech it's really great marriage and it means that we're going to be hiring growing big at that interest center. so um, we are making very heavy use of uh, of storm and trident here at the um, it's pretty much developed as the kind of key appealing factor of our product uh, and you know, th this is basically the, uh, what, what we sell is basically for enter enterprise scale companies, um, is basically a full stack big data platform. Uh, it has three parts. There's the streams part that processes the data, queries part that uh, lets, you know, basically scalable data store, uh, and then batch processing that we do. Um, and you know, what we find is folks who have, what's interesting is it's not necessarily, uh, a lot of our customers don't necessarily fit the big data profile you'd expect. Um, it, it very much is more of the velocity and variety than the volume aspects of big data. So kind of two examples of what you use this for. So uh, uh, Cisco is a customer. Uh, their support group has people who come visit their website and try to download a driver or something and don't find it, so they call the call center to try to find it. Well, the web robots demand, you know, a tenth of a penny to serve up a page. For the call center people, that costs, you know, a fraction of a $10 bill every time somebody calls it. And so if you're at Cisco scale, it's totally worth doing a bunch of work to figure out how can they get customers to answer the it faster. But of course, He's got call center logs over here. He's got like web server logs over there. But he doesn't want either of those. He wants to know that customers were looking for information about the product. And so, um, another example. This one's more hypothetical. This would be uh, in healthcare. You know, the, uh, right now healthcare is awash with companies that are either trying to make practitioners into data collection devices at the one end, or trying to take. Uh, data, one particular type of data, and use it to uh, deliver an interface that disempowers or disrespects the practitioner, and that everybody's ignoring the sea of data around them, right? What you want to be able to do is take all this stuff, do things to it, and make a data store that doesn't look like the robots that collected the data. You want to make a data store that looks like patients who are being administered to by practitioners with various interventions, so that you can tell the doctor how to not fuck it up, right? Um, but what I'm trying to point out is that I think the really exciting thing about Storm Trident, about the streaming analytics in general, a lot of the initial use cases you're seeing it with are, you know, Storm is at the heart of log stash, you know, thing for, you know, kind of just let, let's get the data through this volume case, the throughput case, right? And then the lightweight analytics, you know, web analytics, stuff like this. The things we're seeing uh, people open up their paycheck, their, their, their pocketbooks big for, is what I would instead call uh, doing the query on the way into the data store. So that the thing that's, it's, it's they only see a data store that looks like their business. They have all these, all these robots out there that have all this wild velocity and variety of data, right? Think about this difference in data rate between an ICU device. And when they talk into the little, when a doctor talks into the voice transcoder and they send it off for transcription and it comes back and gets digitized, right? Being able to put data, that fast data and slow data next to each other is proving to be really transformative and really exciting. And so, so, so basically, so we believe trying much more interesting than just the 
raw throughput. That they're basically more, much more than just the raw throughput simple analytics cases. Now, uh, you know, so, so one part of that is kind of, a, you know, so why is it that we haven't been able to do it before? Well, streaming data processing is exceptionally hard. And the central challenge is how do you process billions of records without having to process billions of records affirming that you have processed those billions of records, right? Uh, that basically, how do you manage all the bookkeeping without without yourself needing store and try to, to need store and try? <laughs> if you can handle that, and one of the one of the many elegant breakthroughs in Storm is, is just this remarkable, uh, remarkably elegant uh, approach to that problem. Uh, really, actually, at that point, streaming data processing is easy. <laughs> uh, I'll make it sound fatuously easy. All you have to do is make sure that uh, whenever something needs to, whenever you're paying for something to process records, it's got records to process. And then make sure that whenever <coughs> something's processed a record, it gets the hell away from it so you're not going to keep it in RAM. That's it. That's that easy. Uh, so then there's some details in the middle. And when you start using uh, these things, you will go out on the web and you will find a bunch of people who will tell you, who will lead you right up to where the tutorial ends, and I slap you on the back and say good luck. Um, so I'm, I've got some structured slides, and I'm hoping you guys kind of will ask questions, and if this thing falls into a talk, talk that'll be a good thing. Um, so here is a absolutely generic, trivial uh, storm thing. I mean, you guys have seen the uh, word count examples or whatever. Um, and then this is what it actually turns into uh, when it's in the machine, or at least this is at the first level of the I'll talk about. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that powers Storm is the disruptor cube. I love things like this. It's uh, this Wall Street company, LMAX. Uh, they need to, you know, they, they, like they make money. They they turn microseconds into dollars, right? Like the faster that they can get trades through, the more money they will make. And so they have written for, uh, you know, like th 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 there are a few of these things, right? Like Lucene is like this perfect gem of text processing functionality. So the LMAX disruptor queue, like these guys sat there and they counted cycles and they thought about the L2 cache on the CPU and they learned about what's actually happening when the JVM is turning into the actual real machine and they sat there and they did it. So that you have this remarkably efficient uh, and yet, and yet, incredibly simple from the outside um, uh, uh, queue system uh, that that is kind of at the heart of Trident, of Storm. Um, basically, the the way the disruptor queue works is that you you get one writer. It's actually not like concurrent multiple. You know, it it isn't a it kind of refuses to solve a whole bunch of concurrency things. Basically, there's one writer who gets to put things in, and then and they can use blocking calls, which will wait and only return when it's ready to accept, or non-blocking calls, which will fail if there's a consumer that's too far behind. And then consumers can come in and uh, basically what you do is you say, here I am, give me all the messages I've never seen before, and give them all to you in a batch, and that's it. That's the contract. At the one end, you get to sign up to be a consumer, and you get all the messages since you were there last. And at the other end, a single entity can sign up to be the, a producer. And it ends up being incredibly fast and scalable. It's kind of Kafka, this probably doesn't help at all, but it's Kafka Venom Research, if you're familiar with Kafka. Now, a thing to note is, you know, one question that you'll get asked is, what is how many of you guys are familiar with the CEP, Complex Web Processing System, the more traditional, so um, few enough to explain. They kind of, you know, in uh, Wall Street, uh, security, you know, a lot of things, there's been for a while these uh, systems called Complex Web Processing Systems, which are really finely tuned for lowest end-to-end -end overall latency through the, through the system. Um, that, that you really care a lot about getting a record from the entry point 
to the exit point as quickly as possible, and largely those care about asking questions about the temporal relation of things, so largely their problems are memory bound. Right? A lot of the trident, a lot of the storm trident applications are actually not uh, in general memory bound, they're more because you can just scale it out, they're more CPU bound. So if you're memory bound, or if you're headed for absolute lowest possible latency, this is uh, this is an unjustifiable architecture, right? That I, I guess I should explain this way. That basically between every executor in Storm, there's this disruptor queue, which is the send queue, and then Storm periodically sweeps the send queue. Remember, when you make a request to the send queue, it gives you a batch of all unseen messages, and that becomes one entry in the next executor's receive queue. Right? Then the executor will process all the things in that populating them record by record in the send queue. Those get periodically at some non-coordinated time periods, swept along, and so on. And so that ends up making the internal architecture of Storm really nice and clean. <coughs> um, but it puts a floor on the end-to-end -end latency through the system. So this ends up making it kind of fundamentally unsuitable for kind of those Wall Street style ultra low latency things. On the other hand, what it does, the way I think of it is that Wall Street, given this challenge of having to develop a ultra low, lowest possible latency thing, ended up constructing this marvelous decoupling device, which has the unintended consequence of equipping you with a system that instead of using it to achieve ultra low latency, what you've got is a system that's able to achieve massive tolerance of latency. So the thing you can do now with Storm and Trident that you couldn't before is dumb stuff like query the YouTube API on every record that comes through. Like you can't do that in Hadoop. Right? You can't do that as a store. I mean, yeah, you, you, you can if your CTO wears suits like this, but you know, like, like you, you, it's most of these systems don't tolerate the kind of failure rate, uh, massive variance in latency, complexity of code at the center, etc. You can't put that in a stored procedure, you know, on a database trigger. Like, oh, hey, every time a record comes in, go query the YouTube API. Um, with this person's user ID, hang what comes back off the record, then go ahead and save it. All right, you can't do it in a Hadoop job. So you end up having to do it in like a, you know, uh, rabbit in the queue or something like this, and now you've got all this weird, like, no, you never know when the data is actually going to get into the database and the partial, partial records, and it gets really messy. The disruptor queue stuff here ends up, make, ends up giving you this really large tolerance of latency, and that means that you can pretty much do whatever you want and assume the data is going to get where it wants to go. <clears throat> Want to walk, walk through it a little bit more carefully uh, one more time just to point out that so when records go into the send queue, they come in record by record. Just each time the collector is called with a tuple, that goes in. You'll see it referred to as a message in the code or in some presentations. Like when they start talking about the disruptor queue, you'll hear them use the word message, and there's this different notion of a batch. I want to make sure you're not confused. First of all, message, that's the disruptor queue <coughs> term. That just means tuple for you and me. So like, each thing that goes in, in the disruptor queue world, it's a message, it's a tuple. Okay. Um, so each thing that goes in here is a tuple. Since the contract of the disruptor queue is sweep the queue, and you get a whole bunch of them, you'll hear the word batch. That is not a trident batch. Just ignore the word. Just, just pretend that it always is the word bunch. So you will get a bunch of tuples, and those will go in one slot in the receive queue, that bunch. But that bunch has nothing to do with the tuple tree. It has nothing to do with the trident batch. Then the executor pulls these off in series. Right? The executor queue then pulls off a bunch of these, because that's the contract of the disruptor queue. 
So it pulls off now a bunch of punches and works through all of those in order. And that's actually pretty important. The part here that sweeps, that takes things from a send queue and puts them in the appropriate receive queue, it's actually smart about knowing whether it's destined for a local executor, in which case it goes straight into the other executor's receive queue, or if it's destined for a remote executor, in which case it sweeps it into the remote, into the worker transfer queue. So please note that the send and receive queues are owned by the executor. Uh, the transfer queue is owned by the worker. There is also what is called the worker receive queue. This is not a disruptor queue. It has to do with the zero queue transport. You should ignore it and leave it alone. <coughs> so it's there, it has the same name, ignore it and leave it alone. Uh, these are important to kind of have way in the back of your mind when you come to productionizing and really not otherwise. Uh, just put that in mind. Is that cool? So, let me give you a super small type uh, kind of walk. I want to tell you about the uh, how uh, Trident does, uh, excuse me, how Storm does acting. How does it manage to process billions of records without, without like multiplying, you know, without, the, without requiring many billions of records to, um, to, to ensure it was done correctly. So the deal is that when the spout produces a tuple, it's given kind of a family tree label, right? So, uh, you know, uh, so let's call that one the Ned Stark, right? So that when Ned Stark is born, uh, the actor is notified and makes a record saying, I'm going to keep track of the Stark family tree, okay? Now, that tuple goes next to a bolt, and that bolt is going to process it. There's, you know, uh, John Snow, Bran, I uh, can't even remember the rest of the characters' names. Hey, here, here are all the children, okay? Each one of those is going to be produced, and here's the elegant part. Um, that family tree name uh, is going to be the key for that first tuple and all its descendants. But now for every addition, every tuple that's produced, both the original one and all descendants and descendants and descendants, you're gonna generate oops, you're gonna generate a unique identifier, just a random 64-bit number. And then what you're gonna do is every time a new one has been produced, you're gonna hold in hand the act so far as far as you know from the branch of the family tree you're working on. And every time a new tuple is produced, you're going to take its new random unique ID, and you're going to XOR it onto uh, you're going to XOR it onto the um, partial tuple tree hash that you're tracking. So when child one is born, that's XORed onto the partial hash, XORed on, XORed on, XORed on, and so forth. Then when you act back, you also XOR on the um, you also XOR in the tuple you just processed. And that goes back to the actor. And all the actor does is take this partial checksum and XOR it into the checksum it's tracking for all the sentence of that family trick. So the deal is that the XOR is commutative, right? A XOR B XOR C is the same as A XOR C XOR B. You can shuffle them around all you want. It doesn't matter if they're out of order. And XOR is also its own inverse. Okay? So if you see what happens, um, every time a tuple is made, that tuple's unique ID goes in as one term is XORed into this hash once. If that unique ID will make its way back to the actor, actor as exactly one term in the XOR. Also, every time a tuple is act, its unique ID comes back in and is XORed in as well. Right? And so that thing, this 164-bit number, if every tuple is both generated and act, then that will for sure be zero. 
It is in principle possible for it to be zero anyway, but it is exceptionally unlikely, and it would cause a replay, like it would cause a retry of the thing. But but you can prove that it is engineeringly, effectively engineeringly impossible. Um, and so what you end up with is, yes, you are still having to track each tuple, but you're not having to send them back across the network all the time. And most importantly, you do not have to keep in RAM a kind of uh, you know claim stub for every tuple. You have to keep in RAM a claim stub for every family tree. So you can now have one tuple cause billions of downstream tuples, and you, all you needed was one reliability claim stuff. Uh, and it ends up, I mean, I think that's basically a big piece of the breakthrough that this represents. Uh, do, you guys, do you guys have questions on that? Yeah. Does, does that by any means mean that you can um, track where people came from? That you can track provenance like an of people? people? Um, right, so that you can does that mean that you could track the provenance of a tuple? You can tell what family tree it came from, so that you could tell what the original, original, original was. But you, but you couldn't, from that tease apart, yeah, uh, make so more so complicated uh, provenance. Uh, we just made code that lets you, we have now tracer bullet functionality that we're going to be pushing in to form, uh, that lets you just as a practical debugging matter, it's really nice to have the occasional tuple that knows exactly its value at every single stage and everything that processed it and when. So you can bless the record as a tracer tuple, and it will not, it'll go through completely unmolested, exactly as any other one, but it'll, the framework is secretly hanging off of it, everything that ever happened to it. So uh, we'll be pushing that in the course, and uh, it's already on our branch. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. So the kind of tracks where things are going to go for technically done, but how does it know when things are all queued up? You just start tracking it for, like, how do you decide when zero is a good great, time Great, great, great question. Okay, good. So a, right, so that's another elegant thing. It saves the, uh, it saves the tons of hops. So the question was basically, how does the actor even know that it's supposed to be looking? Basically, the act something, the following things are sent to an actor. First, just the init, the hey, a new family tree has been born, right? And so it makes an entry in this hash it keeps for that. The other thing is that when a tuple has been successfully processed. A single message is sent back to the actor, and that single message has a partial checksum consisting of the unique ID of the tuple that was be, that is being act, XORed with the unique ID of every tuple that was generated. So if you see what's happened there, once that's XORed in, you so so here's how it starts. The first thing is uh, you, you, the first thing is. Um, um, you know, basically, right, so we register the one for next start, right? Now, then the, the one comes in that a bunch of offspring were made, right? And uh, this is going to say act of next start, and then the tuple creation of uh, John Snow and Bran and oh yeah, Rob. Rob, thank you. Right? And so those all get XORed in at the same time. Now what this means is that Ned's reputation is now clean. He has been generated and act. He's actually no longer in the XOR equation. But Jon Snow and Bran and Rob are now hanging. And so it's only when they are act in. And so it's only when somebody dies without offspring that a tuple tree can finally be completed. And so eventually, so 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 in the storm paradigm, you do have to, well, either terminate or you like either have your flow have like an end. Uh, it, it has to be acyclic, or you, or but obviously, you, so the way you make it cyclic, if that was what we wanted, is to get clever. Uh, you'll be surprised to learn that uh, the data chef, that was the first thing he did. Um, <laughs> so if, if you guys know Jacob Perkins, uh, you will you will recognize the style there. So, 
Did that, was that your question? Did that, and did that help answer it? Yeah. Check on learning. So the only things they can sense to be accurate are is that viewers of the previous generation XOR with all the viewers of the next generation. Yes, right. And so that and that is a single 64 bit yeah. record. And so 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 first when the scout makes it, it sends the viewer of the thing that was born. Right. Everybody else, all they ever send is <coughs> GUID of the thing I'm acting and XOR with all the GUIDs of the things I made. Right. Yeah. Good. Um, and there's complications when things can actually be anchored on multiple ancestors. So then it gets, of course, really interesting. The math's the same, and then you mostly don't have to worry about it. So. Cool. So so now let me actually talk about trying to. So first, kind of why it keeps saying. Saying storm and <coughs> myself to try and vice versa. Um, it's my contention that all storm flows asymptote to trident, all storm projects asymptote to trident projects. That if you start with storm and are actually going to build something serious, unless you are sure that you're in that through, pure throughput use case, you're going to find that one day somebody wants to count something or somebody you know wants to handle retries or wants to something and then you're going to end up having to oh, okay well we'll just patch this in we'll patch and what you're going to end up with is a really crappy version of trident recreated in storm the reason that trident got reason trident got written was because it was like the seventh time Nathan Mars had asymptoted a storm project to what became Trident that he was like, okay, I see what I should be doing instead now. So I actually think Trident is the right API to use on top of Storm. Um, and that you really, you know, kind of most projects, you should talk yourself out of using Trident from the very start. There's not a real penalty as far as we've seen. Uh, we have a pretty high tolerance for that, but uh, there's not a real high penalty in terms of performance. Uh, I believe it's simpler. There is way less out there about Trident. Um, so hopefully I can help a little. Uh, Trident gives you exactly once processing. So that is like, that's kind of as huge as the hacking thing. The ability to do that exactly once, um, even when interacting with external <laughs> systems like a database, um, is, is pretty awesome. Um, and so, and it, so, and so it uses the exactly wants to give you kind of a transactional-ish interactions with data stores. It gives you a topology DSL that looks a lot like the Storm one, you, like you guess, and it gives you some primitive aggregators to use with it. So, so it's you know, uh, in terms of like the actual doing stuff with data language, it's like Pig 0.01. Um, but in terms of the kind of solidity of what's underneath it, it's like we're, you know, I will allow that. No, I'm not going to compare it to the It's, it's, uh, Storm is a good underpinning. Um, when you define a, so I'm going to take that poor old word count that I made fun of earlier. Uh, let's pretend this one is something that's going to take things. Yank some text out of it, identify people's names, and count the letters. Uh, for some reason, I won't justify. The, um, uh, in Trident, you know, I'm going to, um, uh, that should say spout. Uh, I'm going to have a spout that makes, I don't know, tweets or whatever, and this parses them. Uh, and then this is going to split the things it parses into letters, and that's going to count them. And that's what the um, that's what it looks like at the trident level. Now, when that turns into a storm flow, so in trident, there's still such a thing as a spout, right? So in trident, you will have a thing called a spout. For instance, we always wired trident up to storm up to Kafka, so that it's going to come into Kafka. It's going to sweep out a batch of things. And Trident ends up being a batch-oriented processing. Storm is strictly tuple by tuple. Trident is going to be batch by batch. Remember when I was like, Storm, the executor queue puts a floor on the latency, but gives you this massive tolerance of latency? This is even yet still again. You know like a, how a movie 
is 30 frames per second and it looks continuous to us, but really it's like these bursts of information presented individually staccato. So that's kind of try it. It's like, it's batch processing, sure, but it's like hyper fast little batches really well controlled. Um, and so, so that ends up being real value. The, uh, so the, the, I guess one of the most important things to know is that this Trident Spout is a bolt. It, it's a storm bolt. But the way Trident actually works is this. A master batch <coughs> coordinator is going to sit there and it is going to, at some tempo, emit a new transaction ID. There's a spout, and this only knows about coordinating success and failure of batches. There's a spout coordinator, the spout coordinator knows how to make sure that batches can be tried back to their source. Because if you have to retry, you may want to make sure that like batch seven always has the same records. You certainly want to make sure that every record makes its way into exactly one batch. That's what the spout coordinator does. These are behind the scenes internal things. There's like a little thing you can click in the storm UI that'll make them appear, but normally you don't even see them. And they call this the spout, which is a bolt. Right. So the master batch coordinator is going to dispense tuples. It's like a spout that's really stupid. All it does is dispense a tuple that says one. And then it dispenses a tuple that says two. And then it dispenses a tuple that says three. So there's this parameter. Uh, with the, here, here's a, a real nice piece of fuckery. It is in Storm. There's this parameter called max spout pending, which sounds well. It doesn't sound like what it means. And you can see that in Storm, so max it, it basically means hey, that's how many tuples you should allow out on the street. So in Storm, that is going to be a very large number because you know you want to make in Storm, you know you would often typically have low multiplicity of tuples running through the thing. And so you would be thinking about how many tuples you would want uh, out being able to be processed, and that is probably a large number, right? Well, in Trident, each of those is a pending tuple. So in Trident, that max about pending is actually the max batches to allow it to be processed in parallel at the same time. So in a productionized storm flow, you might see max about pending in the thousands. Uh, probably a good idea to start with the max about pending and try it at 15 or below. In fact, I, what I like to do is actually set it at 1 and start turning it up, watching what's happening as the flow as you're going along. But start debugging with that at 1. Okay. So those who are the spout coordinator who knows how many spouts there are. And again, this is just saying, um, I don't know, why don't you like do batch, why don't you do a batch and why don't you use like this record through this record? And why don't you also do the same? Actually, it's not exactly right to Um, So the spouts are going to, in response, basically this tuple here, I want you to imagine that in this case, cause the spout to go talk to Kafka and come back with uh, and probably only two Kafka messages, meaning that it emitted a batch of those two records. Then this tuple here caused it to go as Kafka, and this time Kafka only had one message for it, and that turned into one prior to tuple, and so forth. These comprise a batch. Right, all the things tied to the same transaction ID. This, right, like those two together, that is a partition. Please do not think at all about the Hadoop partition while you're thinking about that. It's got nothing to do with it. That is a partition. So a partition is a segment of a batch guaranteed to be held in partial order. Um, I am way over time, 
at this I'm, I'm already over time and would like to get to the partial order or I should just switch to questions. Uh, what do you guys think? No. Uh, all right. Um, apologies for that. It's a big topic. <laughs> the, um, so we're going to have these things come through and let's pretend that, you know, uh, we go into each of these things and we're going to just pull out names that are mentioned. Let's pretend there's the text. We're going to pull out names that are mentioned. Um, as these are just storm tuples, there's no difference from the, 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 like it is just storm. All of Trident just sits on top of it. So it's not doing any, storm is unaware of the batching for almost entirely. And so when we come in and we pick out the letters, so far there's been nothing to disrupt either absolute or partial order. And so you look, and like, you know, you see there was one of the words, there was another. Uh, like, these are all still anchored on their input things. Like, if I had written this out, this would have been, you know, uh, transaction ID 1, and then the first record that came through. So, all of these would have the same value here, that would have a value, that would have a value, that would have a value. So far, still in partial order. Now, the next thing we're going to do is do a group by. So, now the group by causes a repartition. Right. Basically, the group by is going to cause these things, uh, but it, just like in Storm, this isn't an operation. This is just a topological directive. Right? This is just saying, hey, here's what you should do with the tuple once it's ready. Does that make sense? So since it's saying, hey, here's what you should do with the tuple when it's ready, um, is, you know, hey, you know, like, I guess I drew it up this way, right? Like, this guy is going to go to the, in this case, let's pretend there were three states ready to receive them, right? This should go to the third state object, the second, the first, right? Um, so within a partition, it is going <coughs> to ensure that they remain in order. So this A and this E, destined for the same, uh, same aggregator, right? They're going to stay in order. That is guaranteed. That L, M, L, O, those are going to arrive at one in order, okay? But now let's pretend in this example that these two guys were on the same machine, and in fact the same machine as that first uh, Trident operator. And this is on a different machine, the same machine as the second Trident operator. So here's the thing that you will see happen, is that this guy and this guy just had to go from send buffer to receive buffer. So they went straight up, right? Meanwhile, uh, the IMJO, oh, okay, sorry, let me take this. The LMLO, those went straight in, right? These guys, these guys made it in time. They didn't lose race, right? Um, in the second batch, AE, Dustin, for this first one, that went straight in, okay? Because it got to go send up and receive buffer. Also, the stuff from this third batch, from transaction ID 3, won the race over here, coming in in order, before the records from this other machine's batch 2 came in. Okay? And in fact, you can eat, I, I, the way I drew it is that all the partitions were actually held together. But remember, the LMAX sweeping, the disruptor queue sweeping, isn't tied to anything. So you can even have them interleave within that. So, so here's my analogy, is imagine if you were going to take a bunch, you know, so you have an elementary school and you're going to take a bunch of kids to the museum. So what you're going to do is you're going to have all the school buses pull up. Now these kids are unruly in general except in one way, which is you have gotten them trained so that one kid won't pass another in the hallway. Like every kid, when they get off the bus, they're going to be the person they're standing in front of, they'll stay in front of and the person they're standing behind will stay behind. Uh, right, they're all just gonna, you know, like they're not gonna like hold hands as they go through the museum, they're just gonna ensure that they stay in order. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna tie a balloon in the butt of the last kid in line as they get off, each get off the bus. So now you can just have each of those groups go through the museum, right? And you, by the way, you're gonna write the, on the back of the balloon, you're gonna write the number of kids in that group. So now what you can do is you just have the chaperones hang out in each wing of the museum, and when they see a member of a 
school group come through, they just start counting. And when they see a balloon tied to the butt of the kid, they say, well, okay, good. I expected there to be 40. I saw a member of this group. Uh, so I started keeping count. And I have seen that, yes, 47 members of the group came through. And I just saw the balloon on the butt of the kid in the back of the group and it said 47. That's great. Uh, that tour group has just passed, and so it sends a cord to pull back to the master batch coordinator. Right? And so that since this partial order is preserved, you don't have to like keep track of the groups. All you actually have to do is keep track of it. All you have to do is preserve order, which is actually already handled by the disruptor queue. Like see that <coughs> thing where like the single producer was done as a constraint that become a virtue, right? It means that everything happens in order. Uh, just because you preserve the order means you don't have to send a chaperone around with every group keeping them in order. You just have to watch for the punctuation mark at the end of every group. Does that make sense? Is there a way to programmatically uh, carry to see if a uh Google, this is the last in line. So it is actually, so right, so I was careful when I said like you didn't like, you know, make the last kid in line wear a red colored shirt. It's actually, it, that last tuple is the core tuple is actually a separate tuple. So it's a, it's a, it's a punctuation mark basically, right? Th did that make sense? So, so, so you're going to have basically going through, um, remember how I said that a so, a trident spout is secretly a bolt. In fact, every trident operation, no, every trident operation is actually stacked up into something, which is then run by the trident bolt executor. So, so those are all stacked up into a thing that is not a bolt, called this trident. Forget what that thing is called, but then there's finally the trident bolt executor which itself is finally now an executive. So that thing is filtering out a bunch of control flow messages. So the trident operator is going to see A, E. Storm actually sees A, sees E, then A, then chord. The thing representing the end of this <coughs> partition right here. Did that make sense? So there's a, another tuple in there? That yes, is. yes, there's secretly a tuple at the end of every one of those parts. So you see that then in your... So you can, you can only see it... So so I, I, I believe it is only a matter of time. Yeah, I mean, basically, right now there is no callback. So if it was streaming, it would be really nice to... Even if I'm not doing bashing, just to say, right. okay, I stuck the last one, I can now do something. Oh, okay, good. Right. So, so... So Trident gives you, so first of all, so basically in Storm pretty much you get one thing which is more or less, I guess it, it gives you more, but a regular Storm Bolt in Trident is in each. There are other uh, Trident operations. Besides each, there is also something called a, there's an aggregation, a partition aggregate. So partition aggregate is going to be that it will call aggregate, 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 and then on the last one it will call complete. And it gives you an emitter every time. Um, and it actually is a pretty weak uh, aggregation guarantee, but, but basically that gives you, that gives you at the basic level the, the thing I believe you just asked for, which is I want to know when this window happened. Um, kind of we see that there's about, yeah, basically, there's one gap missing where you want to be able to still persist stuff, but be able to process in windows. Um, we have some ideas about that if that becomes. Basically, if, if you look at the Trident aggregations and you see one that's missing, ping me, because I think we may be working on that. So. The point of the last kit is to make sure that we got lost. Good. So, at the end of the school trip, right? Everybody's going to walk back out in front of the museum. And you don't let all the kids ride back on the bus and start driving home. Each school group like, is going to stand in front of their bus, and the chaperone is going to check that the count is good. So that each of the school bus chaperones is going to send a board to pull back to the master batch coordinator. Because basically, this operation of getting back on the bus, this is special. This is a database. This is a database operation or something. Right? Um, 
So in this case, we're going to actually do something special. This is going to be a persistent aggregate or a partition persist. So you radio back with the core tuple. All the core tuples were received. And the master batch coordinator sends everybody back a commit tuple, <coughs> a direct commit tuple. So these are all still anchored on the tuple tree of the batch. Everybody gets their commit tuple, and they act it immediately if they don't have anything to do. Or otherwise, they go, for instance, right to the database. And once they have successfully written the database, then they send the success tuple back to the master batch coordinator. And the master batch coordinator gets all the success tuples, it acts the batch tuple. So in the school bus analogy, this was all the chaperones looked, and at some point the head chaperone like, waved their cap in the air saying, yes, every group has told me that all the members of its group are accounted for. So every group is accounted for. Great. Everybody gets on the bus. This is the initiation of the data. This, that's the commit, right? Then everybody gets back at, to school. We'll call that success, and then the field trip is declared a success, and only then can the fourth grade class go out. Right, so they send out kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. Only when the third grade class comes, only when one of the first four grades comes back, will the next class depart. That's the ending piece. Does that make sense? Yeah. Most. So the whole batch so, they just find all the individual things and they Because here's something that never happens when you're doing data processing. Yeah. Right? Here's something that never happens when you're doing data processing is that you have a file of 200,000 records and then somewhere in line 180,000 is some like foobar error uh, that causes it. Yes. And so Storm's response to this is to retry the entire batch and if that doesn't work, it'll retry it again. Because maybe that JSON is going to parse this time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> We're working on that too. <laughs> uh, yes, it will retry the entire batch. So, is there, I guess I see the difference between a student missing when they're counting up and when you get back versus waiting until they all get back if the student goes missing is the one that you're not going to to. Like, what if your tuple, your special tuple goes missing as opposed to all the students that you're counting? So, so, right, so um, that tuple is just the tuple. <coughs> Basically, that student is part of the tuple tree. Of the, so the batch part of it is only necessary, actually, for the database transactionality. All the retry functionality is just as so, 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 so basically, so I haven't explained how I haven't explained how the batches let you do database writes successfully. I, I can, but at some point, people's wives and husbands are going to start talking. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, we can go out for beers and that kind of or something. But, uh, but basically, uh, the batch stuff is, is basically, basically, trying to give you the guarantee that when you are on a batch, if a commit <coughs> is initiated, you are guaranteed that every transaction with a lower number than yours has succeeded and that no transaction with an ID higher than yours has succeeded. Notice that I totally permitted uh, somebody else to have once saved to the database with the same transaction ID as you. And then there's a really clever trick for handling. But basically, the only thing that it does is says, if we might reject you twice, you had better produce an equally satisfactory answer the second time. And it's just going to clobber over the thing. But that the batch ID is only used for that transactionality. The reliability to retry, that's just Swarm's tuple tree. Um, so it's try to confuse me, but yeah. probably because maybe this is an incorrect assessment of it or, or, or thought about it. It's like, are these batches, do you consider them windows, or are you just, it's just batching? Um, so, when you're doing this stuff, you, when you're watching people use Storm, use trying to use these things, you see that there are the following limits at foot. I'm trying to getting just well, let's find out if I can. can it <coughs> the, uh, so 
there's some amount of data you need to be able to produce an answer, right? Like, I need to have all the web logs from all my web servers if I'm going to tell you how many database hits I got in the last hour, right? Now, some aggregations mean that actually you can, don't have to keep all of it around and able to do it, but if I wanted to tell you the median, whatever, I would have to have all of that around. So let's call that the volume justification. Now then there's also some minimum, there's some maximum volume of data I can have around to do it. So let me call that the horizon of computation. So big data is basically what happens when that volume of justified belief starts rivaling the volume of effective computation, right? Then there's also a bunch of other things that enter into it practically. There's how long you're willing to wait for a correct answer. If, if the answer is I need to know all my web logs <coughs> bits by minute within a minute, then you are going to have to discard uh, some certainty around the volume of justifiable belief because you may not be able to get it in at the time, right? There's a, there's a volume of how long it takes you to push truth out to the edge. Uh, there's a volume of how many batch requests you want to make against a remote system. And there's a volume of how much data somebody asked about, like, hey, what happens if something crashes, you just retry the whole thing. So there's some volume, which is like how much you're willing to retry at any one time, right? Um, then there are intrinsic windows, like, hey, I actually want to count by hour. I want to count by minute and by hour and by day, right? So, so my point is, yes, the batch is used for that. All those things. When you watch people doing it in practice, right now Trident only has one notion of a window. It's hidden from you. It's the batch. It's actually tied to the volume of um, transactionality, basically the volume of computational risk. Not any of the ones that other really interesting ones that I said. That's the big thing we're working on. Is it's basically adding the window. So when you say you're working on, you mean on 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 adding a window predicate to, to, to make to, try to make try to basically if we graft a fundamental notion of windows onto it, and we give it an infinite sorted buffer, then you actually can just throw the do that. Right. Do you see a, a use case for a regular storm topology feeding into Trident and then maybe <coughs> out to Storm again? Is that a if you made me bet whether I would wire through, uh, we have people, I mean, how about this? We'll probably be bringing, uh, what's it called, Log Stash Online, which is pure storm. like. That's a great storm use case. So like we will ourselves be doing it. But I and I think I would not engineer that. But if somehow or another I was actually think if I thought there was any risk I would be doing analytics rather than using it as dumb transport. Um, or or not even how about only slightly dumb transport, like a, just a pure throughput case, record by record. If I thought there was any risk I wasn't gonna do that, then I wouldn't use storm. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Um, so, so for a for a Trident job, you only you can only control one batch size. Like if you're interested in like <coughs> gathering statistics about like per day window, per hour, per minute. Right. So it's interesting. The aggregation paradigm in Trident is actually a infinite window. So the only remember when I said Trident has a few fundamental aggregators. Remember that this was designed by Twitter. They are using it to do things like counting the web logs. If you're counting the web logs, you have to accommodate for the case where some server goes online and it's not until three days later that your remote hands, you know, uh, in, in you know, Oregon can go in and you know, flip the switch on that server. So actually what they do is every, you, you use a backend cache so that every time a record goes through, you go and fetch the former value back out of the database, add it and put it back. This means that you don't actually, so that you, the only reason that the sequence order being approximately the same as the temporal order is interesting is because it makes that caching super, super efficient, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that the way you do 
So I guess I lied a little bit when I said that. So how about this? Badges are used, the one thing badges actually are used for in Trident as, as his maintenance intended, the one thing it's not used for is actually in the window of aggregate. Um, oh, wow. Because, because uh, it, right, it's only used for the transactionality of there. Because he assumes that like there's no way you could ever uh, for the, there's no way the volume of justified belief. Uh, so what he does is says you can only have a volume of aggregation of one, right? That like every aggregate is just the only aggregations that Trident comes out of the box with mm. are the ones where its record and old value produces new value. Um, so, so, so we basically, uh, uh, Jacob just pushed code for the first, to let you, let you do a proper window to say, I have a batch of things, I have now produced the new value of that from this batch, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah. Is that using like the tick tuple or the? Using the tick, no, so it, it does use the part tip, so I haven't figured out yet how the, I haven't figured out what the relationship between window, like, I haven't figured out yet what the relationship of the Trident batch to the window is. Right now, usually it's set kind of based on what Kafka feels like it should be. It's, it's on, honestly what Bush is set by, um, but there should be some sort of rewindowing thing. I suspect it should be in the world of necessary <coughs> batches. I don't know yet. Um, but yeah, no, it's going to be interesting watching those two and feel apart. But yeah, you, 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 um, you actually, what you, the way you do time aggregations is not with batches, it's with, by just looping on the time bucket, but the fact that the temporal order looks like a sequence order makes that grouping <coughs> super efficient. And I'm guaranteed to have all the data within that grouping. Yes, you are guaranteed that the machine that sees it, the machine sees a certain record for a certain time bucket, yeah. that machine will always be the thing that receives right. that sure. for that time bucket and, right. and exactly once in a batch. Right. Right. So, um, working on putting some of this in a book, and we are hiring. If, these, if you were excited to see what the answer to some of the things where I said we were working on it is, <laughs> come, <laughs> come join the team and, and help us figure out what the actual answer was. So that picture's ancient. So that picture's ancient. It is, I know. Yeah. It's when we were upstairs. Yeah. Oh my it's when we had Hugo on staff. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Any more questions? So the answer to exactly when it's processing is item operations? So I didn't quite understand that part. Um, it is, it is, um, it is that trick with the batches, it, that batch guarantee. When I say yeah. we will always have to Maybe lost me with the like good <laughs> analogy and how exactly one thing. Got it. The, if they got back to the bus and some kid is missing or something. <laughs> if the kid is a kid being missing, that's purely a kid or the loop. Yeah. It's really the same thing. Being right. missing, that's purely mm -hmm. noticeable. Like storm just preserves to ensure that if the tuple was getting processed, the tuple is processed. Right. The exactly what part comes from that commitment. From the core commit success. I see. The fact that it says, so if you notice, the buses can drive all set back for school. So the exactly one is on the back. The one on the way back. Yeah. Yeah. The exactly one is on the back. That means that like the batch might be, if you try one, the batch might be only serialized to the database. But the, if the batch is serialized to the database, it's as long as you provide a consistent answer every time, right. it will serialize the consistent answer every time. Right. So do you see it's, it's nobody, how about anybody, people with skepticism about what transactional means have right. already been used by everyone by files big data stuff. Well, actually, now we'll back to being impressed by that transactionality. But this is the kind of transactionality where we will store wrong answer the promise that we will probably, if we ever store a correct answer, so I got you. Basically what you do is you store the last correct answer and the <coughs> new answer. And so then you know that you are, you, you go and look and you, it says on batch 14, I 
eight on the previous value of seven. If you are batch 14, you don't use the mean limit of the current answer. You use the prior one. If you are more than 14, you know that the current value is correct. And so, so basically, if it tries it again, it will do it correctly. Gotcha. Thanks, Lou.